Good afternoon, everyone. Authors at Google New York is pleased to welcome Gregory Mohn today. Gregory is a contributing editor at Popular Science Magazine. His feature articles have appeared in Wired, Discover, Women's Health, National Geographic Adventure, and The Best American Science Writing in 2007. He is with us today to answer a timeless question. How does Santa complete such a large project with such tight time constrictions? Gregory Mohn. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kate, for having me. Um, I was told that part of the reason behind this author's series is to kind of bring in creative thinkers and stuff like that to stimulate you guys and uh, to think differently about problems and things like that. Unfortunately, I have to apologize. I'm not a creative person. I'm a reporter. And uh, as Kate said, I've been working for Popular Science Magazine for a while. So um, this is really strictly a work of reporting. And um, I'm just going to lay out the facts for you and kind of explain how everything works. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Santa Claus and the name of the book, which is The Truth About Santa, Wormholes, Robots, and What Really Happens on Christmas Eve. Um, what we're going to do is run through all the details of his operation from the day after Christmas, um, you know, when he's just finished this incredible work day, straight through to the big night and what happens on that night. We'll talk about wormholes, um, unmanned aerial vehicles, molecular self-assembly, terahertz radiation scanners, warp drive, time travel, um, you know, Santa's many hidden surveillance devices, and some of his innovative new revenue streams, because Santa does have to make money. Um, now, along the way, I hope to clear up some of the myths about Santa. You know, for instance, the flying reindeer. It's a ridiculous idea. Obviously, the sleigh is powered by warp drive. Um, and I also want to address a few new issues that have come up in recent years. Um, one of the big ones relates to how Santa's travel habits affect the spread of influenza. Um, and then also, I have started to get the feeling that maybe he's going a little bit too far in this whole he knows if you've been bad or good operation. Um, I think we have a little bit of a case of a really big, big brother. Um, and finally, I'm going to introduce a new Android app. Uh, the Santa Detector, which was developed with the help, help of a few elves. Um, it's related to the surveillance problem. Um, basically, it alerts you when one of Santa's flying drones is nearby and kind of either listening in on your conversations or recording them. Um, because I'm also, we're giving it away free in the Android App Store because we really want to empower people, you know, in terms of being able to control when Santa is watching them and, and when he isn't. Um, so, I'd, at the end, I'll be happy to answer um, any questions, but I might be a little bit evasive because, as I've said, he's def definitely listening, and Christmas is approaching, and I want good presents, um, particularly a paddleboard, the stand-up, you know, surfing, yeah. So anyway, um, I'll explain also how he doesn't need to fit that through the chimney. It's, it's actually a very different means of assembly. So, um, before getting to the 26th and, you know, recuperation from this incredible work day, I want to quickly address this one of the big myths, which is the idea of a single Santa Claus. Um, it would be impossible for a single guy to do all this work. Say we assume that you know, it takes him four minutes from, to drop off the presents in a home and get to the next home. You know, the standard vision we have, we have him landing on a rooftop with the reindeer drawn sleigh, then he goes down the chimney, he sorts everything out, then he's got to get it back up the chimney, get back in the sleigh, get the reindeer ready, and then he hops over one house and lands again and does the whole thing over. It, it, it's silly, but it would be easier to walk, you know? Um, so anyway, he, even if he did it this way, it would take about four minutes, right? Now, four minutes, if you're thinking about, say, a conservative estimate of 200 million homes in the course of a night, is 800 million minutes, or 555,000 days, 1,500 years, roughly. Now, if you assume he's been in business for 150 years, we're talking about 228,460 years. Then he's got, and that's also counting the rest of the calendar year when he's just kind of hanging out. Um, now, the, the issue here is, even if he's time traveling, you know, and so only a little time is passing for us as we're sleeping and things like that, he still has to live through all that time. So I don't care you know, how happy this guy is, what's going on, he would get bored. I mean, you can't live for, you can't work for 220,000 plus years like that. Um, 
Now, as a result, Santa does have assistants. He has lieutenants, two to 300 of them. The numbers have been growing in recent years due to population growth, obviously. Um, also, you know, some experts have suggested that these, um, these lieutenants of his are clones. Um, but that is, again, another ridiculous idea because obviously, you know, most of the year, these guys are up at the North Pole. Um, there aren't a lot of women up there. It's just Mrs. Claus. And if Santa's got, you know, 200 identical twins rolling around, I, I mean, he wouldn't even want to take a nap, you know, for fear that someone would put on the Bing Crosby and start romancing Mrs. Claus. Um, now, uh, these lieutenants are drawn from a variety of sources, obviously department store Santas, um, retired people in Florida is another great one. They get very bored. They're looking for something new to do. Um, and they generally work on a three-year contract, and they are very, very, very well paid because the job is dangerous. Now, as I said, Santa himself travels via um, a warp drive sleigh, which you can see detailed right here. It looks a little bit like a tuba, but this is, you know, this is an exact sort of infographic rendition based on some blueprints I got. Um, now, he, he travels via the warp drive, warp drive sleigh, but his lieutenants um, go via wormhole. Now, I'm sure some of you guys have heard about wormholes. There are these theoretical tunnels through space and time that can join two distant parts in the universe uh, through, a tiny little, through a tiny little shortcut. Um, you know, here's a classic illustration of them where, you know, normally you'd have to go around the long way, but with a wormhole, boom, you just jump right through the shortcut. Now, normally it's two dis distant points in the universe, but with Santa, it's just, you know, home to home. Um, now, the issue is that wormholes are dangerous things, and occasionally they malfunction. And you can imagine if, if one of the lieutenants is coming through here and something goes wrong, well, he doesn't end up in a particularly friendly spot. Now, he does have you know, emergency, uh, em emergency parts to his suit where he's got accessories such as, you know, he's got an hour of oxygen supply. He's got an emergency signaling beacon that shoots out in all directions. But, you know, unfortunately, we can't totally bend, Santa can't bend all the laws of physics here. So that emergency signal doesn't travel any faster than light speed. So if he's really, really far away, and it takes more than an hour, you know, any, any more than an hour uh, for that light to travel, then he's basically done for. Um, when this happens, um, his next of kin typically receives a seven-figure insurance package, um, which is basically why these guys do it, um, knowing the risk. Now, obviously, the, the question then is why use wormholes? Well, the advantage is that um, they, can con they cut the commute time basically to zero or negative time, because he can travel back in time as he goes from one house to the next. So what we're looking at, really, is a total of 30 seconds per home, because Santa goes in, he delivers the gifts, and then he jumps through a wormhole and goes on to the next home and travels back 30 seconds at the same time. And so, as I said before, though, the issue is that he still needs to live through all this time. So 30 seconds works out to about 190 years total. Um, and divided among all the lieutenants, basically each Santa works six to nine months on Christmas Eve. Um, this is obviously difficult, right? Um, but it is a little bit manageable because of these implanted uh, brain pods they have that, that constantly release drugs that promote wakefulness, alertness, and uh, get a low-level giddiness that people often mistake for you know, this idea of Santa being a jolly old soul, right? That's where it comes from. He's happy because he's drugged. Um, now, uh, anyway, we'll get back to the, to the 26th here. So, you know, he's just gotten through the longest workday possible. Obviously, the first thing they want to do, these Santas, is sleep. So they take a little rest, and then they'll typically go down for a week or so uh, vacation in the island somewhere. Um, normally, it's a private island, because they've tried to stay at you know, public resorts before, but people start to get suspicious when 300 large, white-bearded guys go up to the bar asking for eggnog. Right? Um, now, after this vacation, there's typically a, um, a conference in Las Vegas where they invite uh, a number of business leaders. It's basically like the Allen and Company retreat, only sort of more star-studded. Um, now, why would people pay a lot of money to hear Santa speak? You know, he has been running an organization for 150 years, global organization with thousands of employees. Um, he hasn't missed a delivery or gotten anything wrong in 150 years. And he pays most of his workers in candy canes. 
Um, so obviously, people are willing to pay a lot of money to figure out how he gets this done. Now, um, you know, he'll run seminars at this Vegas conference on supply chain management, logistics, leadership. He hands off story ideas to Hollywood producers on new Santa movies. Um, he advises toy manufacturers on sort of the new products that are going to be hot this year. And then, you know, once this is over, everyone heads back to the pole, and it's time to hibernate. Um, you might wonder, why does Santa hibernate? You know, first, it's boring up at the North Pole. Um, second, it's a little bit lonely. And the other thing is there are tremendous health benefits to hibernation. I mean, the, the fact is, you know, it's fun to think of Santa as immortal, but immortality is impossible, right? What, what he does is he just has an incredible anti-aging program. Now, one of the benefits of hibernation, and this has been proven in loads of research with different animals, is that um, it effectively halts aging. So, you know, when Santa and his lieutenants go down for six to nine months, they don't age for that entire period. Now, for him, over the course of time, that's, that's worked out to Santa himself, the original clause, or OC, saving roughly 50 years, you know, that he would have been 50 years older today without hibernation. Um, now, you know, now that we're on the subject of health, obviously, a big question, you guys are all eating nice, healthy lunches there, right? Well-rounded meals, but Santa eats milk and cookies, right? I mean, this one night, he's just gobbling down loads and loads of milk and cookies. Um, personally, you know, I'm an Entenmann's fan, so if we think about, you know, if we look at Entenmann's cookies and we assume that every house leaves three cookies out for Santa, um, you know, if we look at the nutritional facts, on a box of Entenmann's cookies, which just so happens that the serving size is three cookies. Um, we're looking at 140 calories, right? Seven grams of fat, 10 milligrams of cholesterol. Now you multiply that by a half a million homes, which is what the average Santa visits in a night. And um, you've got 70 million calories, 3.5 million grams of fat, and 5 million milligrams of cholesterol. That's roughly 50,000 times the recommended daily allowance of some of this stuff. Um, then we're looking at you know, the eight ounce glass of milk, which he always throws down because he, he doesn't want to hurt these little kids' feelings. You know? um, so you're talking about each Santa guzzling down four million ounces of milk. Um, now, he can't just work all this off you know, by going to the North Pole and having a personal trainer up there, even though the elves are very, very skilled personal trainers. Um, he needs additional help. So he's got, you know, he's got a gene therapy program. Um, He's got organ printers up there, so if the liver or the, or, you know, the kidneys start to go, um, he can have these new organs printed and, and swapped in for his old ones. Um, obviously, the next question is, how do these, who puts these organs is, you know, in there is Mrs. Claus a surgeon, and, you know, but actually he has robotic surgeons um, that perform these operations autonomously. Um, they're a little bit like, I don't know if any of you saw the Revenge of the Sith, where the robots repair Anakin. They're a little bit like those, but as you can see, they wear silly Christmas outfits. Um, now, Santa and his lieutenants are sleeping through the spring, but the North Pole is hardly quiet at all. I mean, this, this place is not a candy cane workshop. It's an underground data center, with millions of square feet. Um, as you all probably know, the prob problem with data centers is that they're tremendous energy hogs, um, huge air conditioning bills, keeping the server co servers cool and things like that. And um, you might have guessed this by now, but that's the whole reason he's up at the North Pole, is that it's cold up there, and you can just open the windows and cool everything down when you need to. Um, so he saves a tremendous amount on energy. He also has, um, he uses other sources of energy, you know, green energy generators, um, Tur wind turbines would be too, uh, too obvious. You know, people would start to get suspicious when they see little guys with pointy ears you know, fixing the turbines. Um, so he actually uses underwater turbines all around the North Pole. Um, now, you might be wondering, why does he need this giant data center? Um, well, that's because of the surveillance drones that he has all over the world. He's got high altitude you know, robotic Drones, sort of like the Predator, flying over schoolyards, capturing video. Um, he's got micro aerial vehicles, you know, peeking down side streets and through kitchen windows. And in New York, place like New York City, he's constantly tapping into security and surveillance cameras. Um, 
you know, and then all of this video and audio is constantly transmitted back to the North Pole. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is an example of something that's in the works today at a company called Air Environment, where it's a, it's a micro aerial vehicle made to look like a hummingbird. Um, Santa is, is actually, you know, way, way smaller, but it, but it is uh, surprisingly similar. Um, now, the, obviously the, the point of this is he's sending all this up to the pole and then having it analyzed by intelligent video analysis software to figure out who's been naughty and who's been nice. Um, most of it is, do is done, as I said, automatically, but occasionally when there's a question about something, the elves do review it, flag it, and send it to Santa for a look. Now, um, handling all this data has also given Santa and his, you know, Santa's operation, they've developed tremendous skills with handling you know, this, these loads and loads of data. So they've actually started, you know, in terms of new revenue streams, they've started a cloud storage, cloud computing venture. Um, where they will, you know, they'll charge a phenomenally low amount of money um, to to store your data up there securely. Um, but obviously, it's it's covered. Not many people know about it, and I don't even know the name of the actual company they're using. Um, but you know, then inside our houses, he'll have you know, he'll have additional surveillance equipment. Like here's a standard treetop angel, right? We have stereoscopic cameras in the eyes, um, so you get a 3D view of what's happening in the living room. Um, the wings are actually high-gain antenna that are sending all this information back to the North Pole. Usually, if there's a home Wi-Fi network, they'll do it that way at night so it doesn't hog your bandwidth and make anyone suspicious. But um, there's also a microphone array. Um, it's hard to see from, from here, but um, one of these little beads here is forward a little bit, so you have a you have kind of a three uh, three D setup, so they can really triangulate the position of what they're hearing and figure out where it's happening in the house. Um, there's also a lidar scanner, you know, a laser range finder to figure out the distances and where everyone where everyone is exactly. And then there's a frilly dress to throw you off, so you don't notice all the technology. Um, now, I. You know, given this incredible increase in surveillance and all this technology and how Santa's watching us, um, I've been working with a, with a few other people on you know a Santa detector um, that is going to empower people and let them know when Santa's watching them. Um, oh, this is another big concern, right? Forgot about this one. Um, this Barbie doll has a hidden video camera. I mean, this is just another sign that he's gone too far. Right? He's just always trying to watch us in new ways. Um, now, this is you know, an early design for a uh, Santa detector that I found on the web, where it's actually just um, a standard stocking with um, you know, a little device here, and a ribbon goes across the chimney. And when Santa pops out, releases this, the lights go off, and you know Santa's in the neighborhood. Um, the Santa detector on Android, which is available if you guys want to look for it, um, is, as you can see, a simple, simple you know, negative energy meter. Um, so one of the things it does is it picks up um, the negative energy that Santa uses to, um, to travel via wormhole. And it's going to alert you when Santa has been in the area by picking up um, whether, the, whether there's more negative energy than usual. Um, but it also works by, you know, we basically track all of Santa's UAVs and then whenever one of them gets within 10 meters or so of your smartphone, your detector will also go off and let you know um, that Santa's watching. So you can sort of adjust your behavior, or maybe you know, if you see a little bird, hit it with a slingshot or something like that. Um, but be careful and make sure it's actually a robot and not a real bird. That would be terrible. Now, um, as you can see, there's also, um, there's also an option here for parents, because I, I do know that some, you know, I'm a, I'm a parent myself. I have a few little kids. And I know that parents sometimes use Santa to try and encourage their kids to behave better. Um, so there is a way that you can set the Santa detector off manually, um, where you basically can say, OK, Santa's drones are watching. Santa has recently visited. Santa's on his way. Santa is here, but he's invisible. Right? That is obviously the most powerful one. You know, If your kid's being really bad, I would suggest that setting. Um, where the meter's all the way over to the right, and you know there is a an invisible Santa roaming around your house, and so it's a good idea to behave. 
I haven't tested this on my own kids yet, but I hope to soon. Um, now, jumping forward to Christmas Eve. So we've got surveillance all worked out. Uh, typically, Christmas Eve starts with, um, you know, as most Christmas Eves do, with a big meal, you know, a uh, little bit of eggnog, and then typically, you know, a whole lot of coffee because he doesn't want um, his lieutenants going off into people's houses on too much eggnog. Um, so when this is all over, um, each lieutenant has, a, has an elf handler who kind of who tracks him as he goes on his mission. Um, but the first thing they do is they jump through the entrance to you know, the first wormhole. And in basically zero time, they get inside the, next inside the first house. Um, now, Santa doesn't go in there with a big, giant bag full of presents. He actually, um, this wouldn't work. What he does is he goes in and he scans the presents that are there under the tree. Because as we all know, our parents do leave us some presents, right? It's not all from Santa. So Santa, in the days leading up to Christmas, they do track you know, parents' credit card receipts, and you know, they, they watch what parents are buying, and then they cross-reference that with the kids' um, Christmas list, and they can figure out, OK, what did, the, what did the parents leave off? But obviously, some parents also forget you know, certain presents. They forgot about the bag that they hid in the closet or above the garage or something like that. So there are forgotten presents. So really, the best way to Santa, for Santa to guarantee that he's going to deliver the right gifts is to go in there and see what's under the tree. So he's got a terahertz radiation scanner, uh, handheld, obviously, and looks through everything. And basically, that information all gets uploaded, sees what presents are there, cross-references that with his list of the desired presents, and then he knows what to leave. Now. Obviously, one way to do this would be to sort of show up at the house with all 10 presents, and you know, if there's a list of 10, and then just pull out the one that, th that the kid wanted. But Santa has a, a much simpler, much better routine, which is he has a self-assembly device that actually, um, it's, a, it's a little apparatus that allows the, he, he basically plugs in the product code that he wants of the, whatever the gift is, and the, toy self-assembles from submolecular components within this box, and Santa doesn't even have to wait. He just leaves it there, and he goes. Um, that might sound a little bit outlandish, but in fact, you know, self-assembly is a very real field right now. Scientists are working on you know, some incredible stuff at the nanoscale, but I've also had experts tell me that you know, the idea of a smartphone being self-assembled at some point in the future is totally feasible and something that these guys are really actually thinking about. And obviously, it happens in nature all the time, right? We have trees, self-assemble, galaxies, planets, everything. Um, now, so he, he figures out what to leave. He leaves the present. Um, then he drinks his, you know, eats his cookies, drinks his milk, and jumps through the entrance to another wormhole. Um, now, these, these wormhole entrances can be, um, typically, he goes through the chimney because you know, if he were to go through a window and pick the wrong window, then you might have a situation where there's broken glass, and, you know, and maybe Santa gets knocked out, and a child comes out in the morning, and there's Santa lying on the floor with shards of glass. And it's just a terrible way to start Christmas morning. Um, now, the, you know, but, but as I said, wormholes are fantastic. And one of the. Um, one of the problems with them, are, though, is that they are tremendous energy hogs. You know, some scientists have estimated that you need the negative energy equivalent of 318 Earth masses, I think it is, um, just to open a wormhole of one meter in diameter. So what Santa, you know, one of the reasons Santa has asked his lieutenants to slim down and, and have trimmer waistlines is not just, you know, to present a more positive public image and, you know, to fight the obesity epidemic. But also because you know the thinner they are, the less you know the wormhole tunnel, the, the thinner the wormhole tunnel can be, and he can save more energy. Um, he's always trying to be more energy efficient. Now, the wormhole travel method, though, is also you know brings up my next big issue, which is the flu, right? So I, I know I mentioned earlier I wanted to talk about how you know how the flu spreads and how Santa has affected this whole thing. Um, now, today we talk about you know how flu spreads in. Um, and how it's affected by modern travel, such as airplanes and things like that, and how a virus can jump from one place to another. 
so much more easily than in the past. Um, but still, you know, our, our best models don't accurately predict the rate and, and flow of these, of these viruses a lot of times. Now, I think one of the reasons is that we haven't factored in Santa. Now, if you think, you know, you've got a little kid who's coming out and setting up, you know, the Christmas tree and things like that and laying out the cookies the night before Christmas, right? Now, imagine this kid has a cold. Uh, she sneezes on the cookies. Mom and dad doesn't notice, right? Leaves the cookies there. Kids do it all the time. You know, they always forget to cover. Now, hours later, Santa comes in. He eats the cookies, and he ingests the virus particles, right? Now, I know what you're thinking. He's, Christmas Eve is one night. It's not you know, long enough for him to become virulent and contagious. But in fact, if we remember, he's time traveling. And for him, Christmas Eve is six to nine months long. So he you know, definitely has time to become contagious over the course of this night. Now, let's imagine that he stays you know, contagious for a week or so, right? Now, over the course of that week, um, He's depositing all those virus particles on plates, um, the mantelpiece, ornaments. Um, also, you know, don't think for a second that Santa doesn't use our bathrooms, right? He <laughs> drinks four million ounces of milk. He's going to use your bathroom, right? He's going to use a lot of our bathrooms. Um, so if you think of it this way, he's really leaving his germs everywhere. I mean, the guy visits two houses a minute, 120 houses an hour, 2,760 in one of his days because he, uh, he actually gets an hour to nap every 24 hours. Um, so in that one week that he's contagious, he could potentially spread the flu to 19,000 homes. Um, that, I think, is why this is flu season. You know, it's really because of Santa Claus. And I think we all need to address this. Um, I think, you know, one way to do it is to sort of adjust the, the standard stuff we leave out for Santa, right, instead of just the milk and the cookies, Maybe a little thing of hand sanitizer, right? Some wipes. Um, maybe in the bathroom we leave a note that says, you know, don't forget to wash, you know, and we mean you, Santa. You know, don't forget to wash your hands. Um, because, you know, the North Pole is effectively a clean room. I mean, they don't know about proper sanitation up there because they've got robotic surgeons monitoring everything, taking care of them. They're like little babies. Um, so anyway, that's one big issue. Now, uh, the other, you know, the other problem with, um, the other problem with wormholes is that there is, you know, and, and traveling through time over the course of this night is that there is a good chance that Santa is going to run into himself at some point. Um, so plotting the route is very, very critical, you know, doing it so that he doesn't run into himself because he could be a thousand places at one time, um, you know, if, from our standpoint. But the problem with this, as you know, and I talked to an expert at the University of California, Berkeley, about Santa and the time travel problem, and he was explaining that, you know, causality could throw a, a huge, this idea of causality could throw a huge wrench in the whole operation, where, you know, basically we don't know what would happen if Santa runs into himself or if during the time travel, you know, an event that has happened has already, you know, basically changes. Um, we could end up, you know, these wormhole links could be broken. Um, Santa could get dropped off in one of these alternate universes and stranded. Um, so it's, it's another danger, but it's a risk he's willing to take because obviously there are so many advantages to using these wormholes. So, you know, we've been talking about the lieutenants, uh, but as I said earlier, Santa himself, the lieutenants are the ones that do most of the work, but Santa himself still likes to get out there and see the kids and ride around in the sleigh every once in a while. Um, you know, he does, have, he does have reindeer in front of the sleigh, but as I said, the reindeer don't actually fly. Um, as one expert explained it to me, what, we're, what we think of as reindeer flying is actually just an illusion. Um, the illusion of basically what we're seeing is when Santa takes off from a roof and you know, creates a warp bubble out in front of his ship, the reindeer disappear through that warp bubble, and the sleigh disappears with them. And we think of that as you know, flying reindeer, but really, they're just really good leapers. Um, now, the warp drive sleigh has the advantage of, you know, basically, it, it, instead of, um, you know, instead of, what are we up to? 
instead of going from one, you know, from point A to point B and having to travel through all the space in between, a warp drive sleigh will basically pull point B closer to point A. So it shortens Santa's travel time. Now, he has to be very careful because if he wants to go, say, from you know, somewhere above New York to somewhere above Mountain View, he's got to make sure that there's nothing in his path, you know, no airliners, no nothing, because that sh space gets shrunk immediately. So if you had a, you know, a jetliner in that spot, it would be crushed to the size of a pea, and everyone in it would be gone. And again, not a very nice Christmas for them. Um, now, the other part of you know, Santa's mission that's a little bit dangerous is the, the idea of, you know, he is in all these homes. Obviously, some parent somewhere is going to wake up and hear him and get a little bit worried, get scared for their kids, and possibly come downstairs, maybe with a shotgun, and find out who's poking around in their living room. Um, Santa is a nonviolent guy, um, but a lot of times, you know, he's busy with his self assembly and his scanning and things like this, so he doesn't have time. You know, it, it, a lot of times he doesn't react in time to be able to get away and jump through the wormhole tunnel and escape. So luckily what he does have is he has um, his old classic red suit is actually in, in woven with metamaterials that bend the light around him. Um, so when he activate, activates the metamaterials in his suit, he effectively becomes invisible. Um, now, this is a nice little New York Times graphic on, on how it works where basically you can see light waves coming in and getting bent around. Now, in the, in the real world, um, scientists, the real world, I misspoke. I mean, in our world, um, obviously, Santa's world is real. It's just not like ours. Um, in our world, scientists have been able to do this with microwave radiation. They haven't nearly gotten to you know, the broad range of visible light yet. And I had actually, you know, knowing that uh, longer wavelength light is apparently easier to bend, I was hoping that this was a good explanation for why Santa's suit is red, because red is the you know, longer wavelength of the visible light. But um, I proposed that to a, uh, to a Duke expert, uh, Duke University expert on the subject, and he told me I was crazy. Um, now, the metamaterials, though, are also a huge advantage in, you know, in, in villages and places like that, where where Santa doesn't need to jump through the wormholes because, you know, it, it isn't always chimneys. It might be from hut to hut, you know, and you don't need to go through a wormhole if you want to do that. It's quick enough. So, but they're also, you know, everyone might be sleeping in one room. So it's just a great time to be invisible. Now, this is, uh, these are just a few of the technologies that he uses. Um, I, you know, there's quite a lot more. Uh, but one of the big questions that might be on your guys' mind is, where does all this stuff come from? And the answer is, uh, should be fairly obvious, um, aliens, Christmas aliens. <laughs> and that's it. Um, as I said, I'll, I, you know, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I might be a little bit evasive um, or intentionally confusing. But uh, go ahead. Thank you for having me. I hope, I hope uh, it was a good lunch hour. And uh, that's it. The main question I have is uh, regarding the NASA announcement yesterday, uh, arsenic-based life forms. Uh, yeah, they all. How does that impact Santa? Well, it's just, you know, it, it's, uh, it's actually, it could, be, it could be very helpful to Santa because if we, if we do manage to find alien life forms, he, you know, his technology does suffer through glitches now and then, and yet he's not in touch with these aliens on a regular basis. So there are a few things he would like to, you know, if we could get in touch with them and he could talk to them and maybe have them fix some of the underwater turbines up at the pole. Um, some of them are starting to break down over time. You know, it's been 150 years. Um, so yeah, it, it basically, hopefully it'll make his, you know, in the long run, it could make his organization even more efficient, which seems impossible, I know, but yeah. Go ahead. Well, I had a question. Um, I saw an ABCA documentary last year, it's back this year again, called Prep and Landing. It details a lot of the um, activities that the elves do to apparently make things good for the legions of Santas. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about um, career progression and job opportunities in, in the elf world, like how, how is their organizational structure built up? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And as I said, one of the, one of the things that people like to ask Santa when he, when he goes to Vegas is, how do you keep these guys happy? Because, I mean, 
basically, there, there isn't a fantastic career path. You know, they, they're effectively data, you know, software, um, they're, they're video analysts, they're, they're working with the different audio stuff that comes in. Um, they're kind of chained to their cubicles and their computers all day. Occasionally he does, you know, a few very talented elves, he'll let them work with the technology and try to make improvements. But as I said, it is advanced alien technology, so it, it does take them a while to get up to speed. So, yeah, you know, it's a big question. I, I got to believe that, you know, maybe these drug pods that the Santas use are also implanted in the elves' brains and just sort of keeping them giddy. But, yeah, it's sort of, again, it, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, why we're all supporting this guy when he's doing things like this. You know, keeping these elves chained to one position for 150 years, not giving him any opportunity for advancement, and watching us constantly, you know? Yeah. I, I, I know that uh, Santa is a real guy and um, <clears throat> has to rely on organ printers. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about who he is, uh, kind of where he came from, where, when, he, when he met with the aliens and all that kind of background. Right, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but he is from Greenpoint in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> now, he's not, he's not really the originator of the Santa idea. You know, the Santa, this idea of St. Nicholas, Santa Claus has been around for hundreds of years. And um, he was an early imitator. And he was going around Brooklyn, um, 19th century Brooklyn, um, delivering hand-carved wooden toys and things of that nature. And, you know, at some point, the aliens were looking for someone to fulfill this role of this all-powerful Santa Claus. They looked around at the different ones that were operating on Earth at the time, a couple Germans, a few Norwegians. Um, uh, a few Turkish guys as well, because um, St. Nicholas does have some origins in Turkey. But he decided that this guy, you know, Jebediah Meserol from Greenpoint, Brooklyn, was really the one to do it. And so Jeb is now the VOC. Yeah. Very good question. Uh, <clears throat> one final question. Um, the biggest question I've had to answer about Santa is the uh, song, I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus. Not personal, but can you speak to that topic? Because that's been a very charged song in our household. Absolutely. And um, I mean, that lieutenant was fired. <laughs> yeah. And he was, not, he was not paid. He was not given the seven-figure uh, severance, nothing. I mean, he was retired, sent back to Florida. Um, his country club membership was canceled, so he couldn't even play golf anymore. Um, so a lot of, I mean, nobody does that anymore because they've learned now that, you know, if you do that, you, you risk everything. I mean, it's, it's almost worse than getting lost in an alternate universe, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Well, thank you for coming to Google today. Uh, we really appreciate it, and good luck with uh, Christmas this year. Thanks. You too. <laughs>